Well, hello and welcome to this, uh, the first service here at St. Matthew's in Manly uh, for 2021. Happy New Year. It's great to have you with us. Psalm 100 calls people everywhere to praise God. It says, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. And one of the reasons it gives for doing that is that the Lord is good and his love endures forever. So would you be on your feet as Dave and the band lead us in our first song for 2021? Welcome to church. We're going to sing and worship our great God. We're going to sing with joyful noise. Come on, stand up on your feet and sing with us. Your love, it came to me. You took my place and set me free. Lay my 
Again, it's great to have you here. Our service today uh, is a little different to what we've been doing the last nine months or so. Uh, we've been so well served by the pre-produced services through the week. Uh, but today, uh, the training wheels are off and we are live from St. Matthew's down on the Corso this morning. It's great to have you here. Um, we trust what we're doing today will be really helpful for you. We are here to engage with God. As we, as we sing his praise, as we pray to him, and Kate will be leading us in prayer in a little while, and as we listen to his word. These are the things we do to engage with him as we engage God together. Uh, across January, we're going to be looking at a psalm each week. Uh, we've themed this month the, the living God each each week we'll be looking at an aspect of who God is and how God is towards us. And today we'll be listening to Psalm 19, a psalm which says so much to us about how God is a God who speaks. The living God is not dumb. He speaks. He speaks to us in ways that we can understand so we might know him and know how to live in his world. Uh, so our Senior Minister Bruce will be speaking to us from Psalm 19 today in a way that helps us understand the immense relevance of this reality to our lives as we face another uncertain year uh, in 2021. Uh, as well as Bruce speaking, Bruce has also asked Suzanne, our women's minister, whether she would share something of her own experience from last year. I mean, what a disorienting year it was. But Suzanne will share how God's word, his living word, was such a help to her in in guiding her and carrying her through 
a really challenging year for her and for so many of us. So there's lots of great things to look forward to uh, uh, today as, as we come together. Right now, Kate is going to come and lead us in prayer. Thanks, Kate. Hello, my name's Kate and it's my pleasure to pray with you this morning. My husband and I attend the 6.30 service with our new baby daughter. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we would rejoice in your greatness and your power, your patience and love, your mercy and justice. We thank you for the start of a new year and thank you for the year that has just passed. Lord, we acknowledge that last year presented many challenges for our local community, our state, our country and the world with natural disasters, COVID-19 and econ economic struggles, among other things. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us throughout it all. We thank you for the opportunities to grow throughout these challenges. We praise you for you are a constant throughout our challenges and a refuge for our weary souls. Lord, we continue to pray this morning that you would restrain the effects of COVID-19. We pray particularly for our state with the most recent outbreak. Lord, we thank you that our local manly area and the northern beaches at large has seen reducing COVID case numbers over the past few days. We thank you for the easing of restrictions in the southern northern beaches and continue to pray for reduced case numbers and the easing of restrictions in the northern northern beaches. Lord, we pray for our leaders from local, state and federal government as they continue to manage outbreaks of COVID-19. We also turn our attention to the world and those countries facing increasing case numbers and new outbreaks, including the United Kingdom, the United States, India, Brazil, Russia and France, among many others. Lord, we pray for the virus to be restrained and for the distribution of a safe and effective vaccine. We turn now to pray for the St Matthew's Care Ministry. Lord, we pray that our St Matthew's community would be a community shaped by love, like God's love for us in Christ. We pray for our pastoral care minister, Andrew, and his wife, Rhonda. We pray for Andrew for insight and energy as he builds and trains teams to practice pastoral care and for wisdom and grace as he oversees the 8 a.m. Con congregation. We also pray now for our mission partners, the painters in Cambodia. We thank you for the opportunities for Dave and Leonie Painter to share the gospel during the COVID-19 pandemic. We ask that you would use Dave and Leonie to equip students at the Bible school to be faithful and effective preachers of God's word. Lord, we pray for their translation team working with Dave to translate resources to equip God's people in Cambodia. We pray also for the church that Dave and Leonie have started in their home this year. Lord, we pray that they would reach many people and their neighbours with this new church. Finally, Lord, we pray for those who are suffering and that bring those to you now who we know that are struggling at this time. Lord, we pray that as we commence this new year, that we would be filled with your hope, joy and peace as we trust in you. Amen. Thank you so much, Kate. And a happy new year to you all. Do you know how nice it is to stand here talking to this camera, but knowing that you're all just behind it? So when Bruce asked me to share my reflections on 2020, I was like, how long do you want me to share for? And he's like, oh, probably 10 minutes. I thought, oh, I could scream and cry and laugh and then scream and laugh and cry again for 10 minutes straight. That'd be easy. That's basically how I felt most of 2020. And I'm sure all of you as well. It's not what we imagined it would be. My sister and I were just talking the other day about these social media posts everywhere saying, um, can't wait for 2020 to be over, you know, as if by some weird magic, the earth was going to reset itself on 1st of January 2021. Not so, hey? But you know what? God is still in control. 
He's still the same God, and he is enough. Our God is enough. One of the verses I've clung to in this past year comes from Psalm 24, 1, and it says, The earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. This means that everything that happens in heaven or on earth is subject to God's commands. He's in charge of all things. Nothing can take place without him sanctioning it. So Bruce asked me to specifically reflect on some verses of scripture, some words from our powerful, beautiful God that has helped me through 2020 and will continue to light my way in 2021. I really pray that some of this will be helpful to you as well. So I'm going to do this in two parts. First, I'm going to look at some verses from the Psalms, and then I'm going to look at something from 1 Thessalonians. So I'm going to read some verses from Psalm 73 in a moment, because praying the Psalms has been key for me this past year. I was given a book probably a year or two ago um, that teaches you to use the Psalms as prayers, and the gist of it is that the Psalms give you a gospel third way to approach your feelings and emotions. What this means is that there are three key ways to approach feelings. So the first one is what I would call like a religious approach to feelings. It's uncomfortable because we feel things, but we don't necessarily want God to know that we feel these things because that might make us fall out of favor with him and then we won't earn his love. Now, this is not the truth, by the way. That's the way that we think somewhere in the back of our minds and in the depths of our hearts. God cannot possibly know what I'm feeling because it's plain embarrassing. So we suppress them, right? We're saying, I'm okay, um, I can do everything because Christ gives me strength and I'm supposed to be totally okay and I've got to turn the other cheek because we've got all the tools, right? Then the second way is um, what I'd call a secular approach to feelings and that is to say that you f what you feel is who you are. What you feel is the truth. Kind of like, this is me. I can't do anything about it. This is just who I am. What I'm feeling is who I am. It's a dangerous one. The third then is where the Psalms gives us this gospel third way to deal with feelings. It's not a discussion of feelings or an expression of feelings. No, the Psalmist is saying their feelings and processing of their feelings they do in the presence of God, okay? Tim Keller writes, to be underaware or overawed by your feelings is a disaster. Underaware or overawed. So this is something I've loved trying to do this year, using the Psalms to pray my feelings and process them in the presence of my creator. Now, just a little disclaimer before I go on. In no way, just because I'm telling you that I do this, do I nail it? I do not do it consistently. I'm not on some higher spiritual level because I'm doing it. I want you to know that as I'm standing here today speaking to you, I'm a broken, sinful person with many issues, lots of baggage, lots of dysfunction in my life. But I'm loved by God, and I'm forgiven, and I love Jesus with great passion, and I'm striving. I'm striving every day, and I'm trying, and I'm failing every day to become more and more like him. So I'm going to read some parts of 70, Psalm 73 to you now, and then I'm just going to say, sh share some thoughts that I hope will be helpful. Okay, so listen to what the psalmist Asaph writes in Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. I'm just going to jump forward a bit. Verse 13 says, Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning breathes new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, 
but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So just reading through that, especially those first few verses, how uncomfortable and confronting are some of these things that Asaph writes. I almost can't believe he says it all to God, right? Like it's so raw and so real. So taking this psalm as an example, what is Asaph trying to process here? I think he's trying to process injustice. Asaph is experiencing doubt because of the injustice he sees all around him. Doubt does not come because we don't believe the evidence. Doubt comes when we cannot believe the evidence in light of what is happening in our hearts. So what do we do when doubt comes? First, look into why you're doubting. Is it because you want what you are envying? Are you doubting God's purpose? I know I do. You don't get into doubt by thinking only, so you will not get out of it by thinking only. You need to participate in worship to God. Pray, sing, repent, engage all your senses, just like Asaph is doing here, just like I've been doing when I'm praying the Psalms. You're doing it with active participation. Another thing that Asaph does in the Psalm is he's processing, as he's processing feelings in God's presence, is he's making sure that his foot is not on shaky ground. If you put your foot on a rock while you're hiking somewhere, your faith is actually in that rock, isn't it? So whatever you do, you're putting your faith in something. What I mean by this is it takes faith to believe that there's a God with a purpose. But it also takes faith to believe that there's not a God. So for believers, we really struggle thinking that God is working and allowing all the suffering and injustice we see all around and experience for ourselves. But to be honest, to believe there's not a God with all the same suffering and injustice is definitely a more horrifying thought, a way bigger problem. Because that means the suffering and injustice is just natural, just the way things are. I want to say today, believing in God is hard. Not believing is way worse. Asaph gets to the end of his prayerful processing in God's presence with these beautiful words. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So the Psalms, one great way to worship and engage with God and emotions. So the second key piece of scripture that I've had in my tool belt this year is from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. It's also the scripture that Bruce had on his email this week. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now this will be brief because I think the scripture says it all. And I'm so sorry if you've heard me talk about this little piece of scripture countless times. In fact, the last time that I was asked to speak from the front was that last Sunday in March that we actually met together as a church in like normal circumstances before everything shut down. And this was the piece of scripture that I also brought from the front. So these three little verses just continue to amaze me. First of all, because I've got a complete mental block with memorizing scripture, but I've been able to memorize this scripture. And not have I only been able to memorize it, but it's been invaluable to me to have it in my tool belt, ready to go to bring out, to counteract spiritual attack, to just counteract toxic thinking day by day. And secondly, because of the context around this, because this is written by Paul to the very new Christians from Thessalonica facing extreme and brutal persecution just for having the guts to say that there's a king aside from Caesar and that king's name is Jesus. So these verses are not written to people who are sailing through life by any means. No, they're written to people who are facing huge suffering. But guess what? The beautiful part is their faith is flourishing and growing amidst it all. So anyway, I've told you this on many occasions as well, but I've got many alarms going off on my phone during the day. I've actually quietened them all just for this little period of time. And all of them have different script um, text and uh, scripture attached to them. And this um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 is my 10 past 12 alarm that goes on off every single day. It has been going off with that scripture, I think, for two years now. And every day that it goes off, I say the scripture out loud. And every single day, I need to hear it. I need to hear it in that moment, and I need to be believing it in that moment. So just a little encouragement. Do not give up on trying to form a good spiritual habit. Just try again every day. So 
So I'm going to say these verses to you again now. Rejoice always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This will get us through. Rejoicing, praying, giving thanks, no matter what. Because God is enough, he's all-sufficient, and he is in control. This will get us through, and not just barely. It will get us through singing his praises, growing in love for him and others. It will get us through 2021. It will get us through 2022. And however long it is God's will for us to walk this earth until we come face to face with our most glorious, powerful, everlasting, mighty, and gracious God and Father. Amen. It's a real joy to be able to come and read the scriptures with us all today. I'm Kath and I attend St Matt's usually at 10 and 5 o'clock services. Our reading, we've got two readings today. If you want to follow with your own Bible at home, put a finger in Hebrews chapter 4 and after you've done that, flick back to the Old Testament to Psalm 19 and that will be our first reading. I'll wait a moment while you find those passages of scripture. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. The words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom that comes out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And then moving over to Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you to be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we, who have believed, enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere 
he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, They shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disbelief, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about that day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the word of God. Well, welcome along everyone, great to be here and as Andrew said at the start of the service, it's a new experience, we are live streaming, I'm down at the building and this is happening from St Matthew's in Manly on the Corso. Let me start by saying I remember back in August of uh, this past crazy year of COVID-19, I was talking to one of our church members and we were reflecting on the year, how crazy it was and he sent me this meme and it said 2020 cancelled, I'll read it to you. After careful consideration, we have decided that it's no longer in the best interests of everyone involved to proceed with 2020. While we recognise that a lot of hard work has gone into preparing for 2020, if we're honest, it's turned out to be a disaster and we feel it best to call it off. We understand that some of you were looking forward to seeing what cruel, peculiar, new realities 2020 would throw up next. But on the balance, we believe it's probably best not to find out. We will instead provide ticket holders with a full refund or an exchange and start afresh with 2021 on Monday. Our plan is to deliver a more enjoyable year, similar to, say, 2016, which everyone thought was the absolute worst year of all time, but in retrospect was actually a walk in the park. So see you next year, management. Well, here we are. It's the 3rd of January. It is 2021. And what lies ahead for all of us? It's interesting, 12 months ago, if you go back, Gladys Berejiklian had just declared a state of emergency for this state with the bushfires, and who would have thought we've had the year we've had? And as we start this year, I thought, what better place to start than to just think about God and who he is and his character and what that means for us. And we're going to be going through a number of psalms and it's called Encountering the Living God in the Psalms. And each week we're going to look at a key aspect of who God is. And this week I've picked Psalm 19 and it's the God who speaks. And if you're familiar with the Psalms, there's 150 in what's called the Psalter. And three of them, Psalm 1, 19 and 119, are Psalms that reflect on God's word. The Torah as it was known back in Israel. And this psalm, C.S. Lewis, the famous writer and thinker, said this, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. So no pressure, Bruce, don't stuff it up. Here you go. So when you read this psalm, uh, and I've been reading it this week, it is a magnificent psalm. I'd encourage you after the service to take it away, read it, 
and think about what it says. There's obviously two key things that it revolves around on the topic of God speaking. From verses 1 to 6, it talks about the fact that God has spoken generally. And then from 7 through to 14, it speaks of God speaking specifically. And let's have a think about those two ways that God speaks. Firstly, God has spoken generally. And if I were to ask you the question, how is it possible for anyone in this world to know God? To know that there is a God? Psalm 19 starts this way. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. And what the psalm is saying is if you stop and if you walk out at night and if you look up, it won't just be the heavens that are speaking to you. In fact, God is going to be declaring his glory to you as you consider the work of his hands. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. But it then says in verse 3, almost contradictory. They actually have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In other words, there's this silent voice that creation speaks with. No words, no proclamation, but yet it's declaring something incredibly powerful that leads you to give glory to God. And the psalmist then narrows his focus in the second half of verse 4. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun, and he focuses in on the sun here. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and you think of the bridegroom at his wedding, all dressed up, looking incredibly handsome. He's just come into the building. Well, the sun is like that like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, it makes its circuit to the other, and nothing is deprived of its warmth. And what he does here is he stops and just picks out the sun to give an example of the wonder of God's creation and how it speaks of his glory. And he's reflecting here on both the majesty and the power. Everyone experiences the warmth of the sun, as well as the orderliness of it. And we all know that reality. The sun rises in the morning, it travels across the sky, it sets in the evening, and it does that day after day after day. Have a look at this picture. It's from Matt Lamley, one of our night church guys. Uh, He's a videographer as well as a photographer. And it's a sunrise at Manly. We're very familiar with them. They're magnificent. And when you stop and see it, it leaves you wanting to praise God because you see his hand at work behind it and it gives glory to God. No word spoken, but yet a powerful testimony. And what fascinates me is the way so many people can look at the creation and say there is no God. Even top scientists say this. But let me say there are many scientists who look at the world and they don't just see, if I can say, scientific processes that take place. But they say there is a God who is behind it. One of those is a man called Francis Collins. If you're not familiar with him, uh, Dr. Francis Collins is a scientist of the highest calibre. He's won all kinds of awards. And he led the Human Genome Project in the USA, which led to numerous groundbreaking health discoveries. An incredible mind. Not as a child, he went went to church, but he didn't find faith there. But later on, on a medical ward, visiting someone who was sick, he encountered a woman of very strong, assured and joyful faith. And it led him on a journey of discovery that this creation that he knew as a scientist was made by God. And he's written a book which is called The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence for Belief. And he said these beautiful words, the God of the Bible is also the God of the genome. He can be worshipped in the cathedral or in the laboratory. His creation is majestic, awesome, intricate and beautiful. In other words, you can look up to the sky and see the glory of God. You can look down the telescope and you can also see his glory at work. I often say to people, how can there not be a God when you look at this world? It just declares to us. I mean, how is it that you explain the beauty of this world? which is magnificent. If there is no creator who designed it, 
How do you explain the order? As wild and untamed as our world is, everything in nature follows a specific order orchestrated by someone. And we would say that's God the creator. And this universe is this incredibly fine-tuned entity that if just one or two constants were to change, it would completely eradicate what we know of as this world. How do you explain that if there's no designer? How do you explain our belief in justice and our longing for it if there is not a God who is over us or the sense of love or search for meaning and purpose in this world if there's not a God who's made us? The heavens declare the glory of God. And so just from the creation itself, we can know that there is a God who exists that he is our creator and as such he is over us. And because of that we're accountable to him. But the problem of non-verbal communication, I'm sure we're aware of this, is that we can easily misinterpret it. And that's exactly what humanity does with the non-verbal communication that comes from creation. We actually need more if we are to know this God with clarity and we are to be in right relationship with him. What we need is a clear, spoken word to explain this God and to bring clarity to the topic of who he is and what he requires of us. And nature tells us of God's reality and of his power. And we've been made in a way that we know intuitively that he is there. But that won't tell us about the saving grace of his Lord Jesus Christ. Nature tells us that God is mighty and that we are his creatures. But it won't tell us that we've turned our backs on God, what the Bible calls sin. And that as we naturally exist in this world, we're out of relationship with him and we need forgiveness. We need more and that's exactly what the psalm goes on to say. God has not just spoken generally in creation, he has spoken specifically by his word. And in the second half of the psalm, we learn about how it is that God has spoken and it's a clear, powerful, personal, enduring word. Let's have a think about what these seven, uh, seven, eight verses say. In verses seven to 10, if you've got your Bibles there, have a look. There are five different descriptions that are given for how God has spoken through his written word. Verse seven, there is the law of the Lord. Verse 7, second half, the statutes of the law. Verse 8, there are the precepts of the Lord. There's also the commands of the Lord. Verse 8, verse 9, there is the decrees of the Lord. And what you could say from a literary point of view, there's no doubt a poetry that is going on here. And it's a poetical way of using different descriptions to describe the one reality that God is a God who has spoken through his written word. But there's more to it than that. When you look at these individual words and what they describe, the law, the statutes, the precepts, the commands, the decrees, theologically, the psalm is showing us that there is a completeness to God's word. It is teaching, it is testimony, it is direction, it is wisdom, it is commands, it's prescription. It's a book that speaks to the totality of our human condition. No matter what you're going through, there will be a word in this book that we call the Bible that speaks to us to bring comfort, to bring help, to bring assistance, to bring challenge, to bring warning. And interestingly, in this psalm, it's as he reads the word that he knows that he's warned and that he's aware of his sin and that he knows that God is his redeemer. And so God's word is a written word that speaks totally to our human condition. But secondly, it's a powerful word. Verse 7 says it brings life. It actually revives the soul. It's got a power to it. But it also brings wisdom for our life. It helps us live well. Verse 8, it brings joy to our hearts. And it does that because we meet the God who is gracious and who loves us. And it brings light to the mind. In other words, it reveals God to us. And you see, this is the power of God's word, and that's why I wanted to have someone, and it was great to have Suzanne come and share about how the word helped her through all of the craziness of 2020 and COVID-19. The Psalms so pastorally helpful for her in terms of processing what she was going through. And that just short, profound verse from Paul, guiding her every day. 
And this is the power of the word. And I love what uh, the writer to Hebrews says, and that's why I had that second reading. Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is alive and active, and it's a living word. Yes, it's written, but it's a live word. When we read it, we hear God speak. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thought and attitudes of the heart. In other words, when you read this with a heart that is open to God and you're wanting to listen to him, it will speak to you powerfully. It will confront you with who you are, but it will also tell you of God's incredible grace and love and forgiveness that we find at the cross of his son, the Lord Jesus. But thirdly, it's a lasting word. I love what verse 9 says, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And when you, hear, when you read this word, it produces an awe in us. It endures forever. The decrees of the Lord, they are firm. In other words, they are a foundation that you can build your life on. And this word endures forever. And I think the incredible thing is, it's a book that was written by many different authors over hundreds of years, it's been put together in one compilation. It's what we call the Scriptures, the Bible. And it was written then, knowing that we would read it now. And God speaks to us now. And through every generation, this written word, when it has been read, when it's been proclaimed, when it's been shared, God speaks to people through it powerfully. It is an enduring word that lasts forever. But lastly, it's a personal word. And I don't know if you notice the contrast between the first six verses and the following seven, eight. At the very beginning, God is only mentioned once. And it's with a general term. He is the God of creation. But when the psalmist reflects on the written word, he describes God as the Lord and that word is the word for Yahweh in the Old Testament it's the name that Moses was given when God revealed himself as the redeemer and keeper of his people and seven times in the second half of the psalm we are told that the Lord is the one who is speaking to us and at the end of the psalm you get these beautiful words but who can discern their own errors forgive my hidden faults Lord in other words as God is speaking personally to him, he's confronted by his sins. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I'll be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And you see, God is not some distant God who is just generally known. He is known personally as his redeemer and his rock. And he is his servant. And when you hear the word of God address you, you are confronted with yourself, but the word reveals his love and grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, that the word became flesh and the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, speaks to us through the eternal gospel, which we have in the scriptures. And so from creation, you're going to learn great general things about God that will lead you to glorify him. But it's only as you hear the word of God proclaimed, as you read it, as you study it, as you listen to it, will you hear the call to turn from your sin and come to the living God and receive forgiveness and hope and love and mercy. Because it's a specific word that saves us and brings us into friendship with God as our Father. Well, let me finish by asking us a question. Why did I want to start the year with this psalm? Why is it this psalm and not one of the other 149? Well, I want to ask a question of us. What word will you trust in in the next 12 months? What will be your wisdom? Because here's the crazy thing. We don't know what this year ahead is going to look like. And I think all of us, we would love it to be a very different year from this past 12 months. Where a virus is eradicated, where a vaccine is rolled out. But the reality is, I think it's going to be another year that will be very difficult. And what will be your wisdom, your strength, 
your lot? What will guide you? Well, I want to put before us, it's the word of God that has been written down for us that needs to be our light, our strength, our wisdom for this year ahead. And if I could just reflect on the past 12 years, not just 12 months, of being here at St Matthew's. I moved back to Sydney 12 years ago. And over that time, every year, the Christian faith and the Christian church seems to move more away from the centre of society. And every year it seems to get a little bit harder to be a Christian in this world and in this culture. Now, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying that's how it is. And while there is no doubt a great respect for Christians and the church in some sections of our society, every year there seems to be just this growing noise that Christianity is at best irrelevant for the world today and at worst even dangerous. And our culture has become increasingly subjective in how it understands reality. My truth is all that matters. There is no objective truth that we can all together cling to. And you see, when that is the culture, that is the air we breathe, it completely undercuts the objective truth that is revealed in the scriptures, this specific word from God to us. And it affects us as Christians because we are tempted to believe that God's word, all of God's word, is not good for us. It's not authoritative over us. It's not relevant for us. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible is totally relevant. We don't have to make it relevant. It is relevant because it's God speaking to us today. And today there's what I would call a truth crisis. We live in an age where we are saturated by social media and one of the impacts of that has been, it seems to be that whoever shouts the loudest wins. And truth is incredibly subjective. And as I said, reality is for most people what I believe internally, not anything external to me. And the result is, when you think about the truths that scripture proclaims, that there is just one God that he has sent his son and he is the exclusive saviour of the world. That just seems arrogant today, to believe that. That this, this word is inspired. It's not just a religious book, it is God's word, all of it. And you think about the moral realities that are spoken of here, in terms of how we understand living life, our identity as men and women, Questions of human sexuality, questions of greed and justice, moral questions around sexual purity. Is it okay just to have sex with whoever? Questions of the beginning and end of life. All of these questions and all of these issues, our culture is saying, this book does not have the answers. And what it does is it erodes our confidence in it. But friends, this book clearly proclaims to us there is one God, he loves us. He has sent his unique son to come and save us. And his name is the only name that can save people that has been given to us from heaven. And he calls us to live holy lives that honour him. And he calls us to reflect his love, his truth and grace with compassion in this world. And he wants us to live pure lives where we are generous, not greedy, where we are sexually pure and that is a beautiful gift, but it's for just within marriage between a man and a woman. And he wants us to announce this word with confidence and boldness to the world that there is a God who loves them and is calling them to come back to him and to repent and to believe the good news. And friends, in this age of subjectivity, where we are on the margins of society, This word is our lifeline. And that's why I love what verse 10 says. And if I can just read it again, and he's speaking of the word of God that's been revealed to us in scripture. These words are much more precious than gold, than much pure gold. And friends, that's what we need to hold on to, that this is our most valuable resource this year, the scriptures. And I love what he says, they are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. In other words, when you read it, It will bring you joy. 
And so my call to us this year, as I ask the question, what is the word that you'll listen to? I call us to recommit to trusting in the goodness, in the authority, in the power, in the life that flows from the scriptures as we hear the gospel proclaimed to us and the call to repent and believe the good news. And so in 2021, will you read this word? Will you study it? Will you believe it? Will you live it? Will you trust in it? Will you obey it? And importantly, will you share it with your Christian friends and family and with this world that is lost and broken and on a highway to hell? Will you bring the good news of the gospel to those around you? Because that's what we desperately need to do in 2021. Let's just stop and have a moment to pray. And I want to finish with uh, the words at the end of the psalm. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and redeemer. And I pray for all of us that that will be true for us. And I've written a prayer for all of us to pray as a church to rededicate our lives to the living God this year and to his word. And so let's just be quiet and if you can look at the screen, a prayer will be coming up. And it's a prayer that gives voice to wanting to dedicate our life to him and his word and to the Lord Jesus. And I invite you to pray it now with me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for getting us through this past year with all of its difficulties and challenges. As we start a new year, we renew our trust in you and your word. May it be our strength and wisdom in all that we do. Help us to read it, to believe it, and to do what it says. Thank you most of all for sending us your living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we find our strength and identity in following him this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, may that be true of us in the 12 months that come. We're now going to stop and sing and give praise to our great God. Over to you, Dave.
as your phrase our hearts we cry this pools we see great are you lord and though the earth we shout your praise our hearts we cry this pools we see This plainer of the key, clothing majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles are his voice, and trembles are his voice. I great in song, God. See with me, I great in song, God. And don't we see, I great, I great.
is our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how marvelous God you are. How great is our God, see with me how great you are. to kick off the year here at St. Matt's. Uh, Whether you're uh, live uh, with this service that we're streaming here, whether you're streaming later in the day at 5 or 6.30 or at some other time. We've been celebrating today the living God, the God who speaks, the God who speaks to us through a manly sunrise, the God who speaks to us personally by his word, a word which he has caused to be written down and by which he continues to speak to us quite personally. Uh, We're living in a stage in history where there are many voices that are competing for our attention. There's a million of them that you can get almost instantly here on your phone. Uh, But there's, there's one voice, one voice, which Bruce from the scriptures has challenged us to make sure that we deliberately choose to listen to 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 study, to obey, to live by, and to share. Uh, The question today, the challenge that we've had is, what are you going to build your life on in this year to come? Where, Where will you turn? What will be your guide? What a wonderful thing to know that our living God, the loving God, has spoken and continues to speak to us. As we close, we're going to hear again from his word, Uh, A word which Cezanne helped us see has been such a help to us in this last year and actually for a considerable time. From 1 Thessalonians, God spoke this firstly through the Apostle Paul to to Christians in Thessalonica who were doing it tough. It was a brutal regime they lived under. And here we are today at the beginning of 2021. Would you take this challenge, brothers and sisters? Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen.